warfare in Mosul. Democrats test Trump in Kansas. And California farms face a labor drought. North Korea escalated its threats against the United States today, warning of a nuclear attack in response to a U.S. Navy strike team deployed to South Korea's coast during annual military drills. Attorney General Jeff Sessions toured the U.S.-Mexico border today. For the first time, he offered details on the Trump administration's plan to fight illegal border crossings. We mean international criminal organizations that turn cities and suburbs into war zones, that rape and kill innocent civilians. It is here on this sliver of land, on this border, where the first we first take our stand. German officials are investigating three explosions that blew out the windows of a bus carrying one of the country's premier soccer teams. At least one player from Borussia Dortmund was sent to the hospital, while others were said to be in shock. Police found a letter claiming responsibility. France's interior minister visited the ruins of a migrant camp today to survey the damage after a fire tore through it overnight. The government is housing some of the displaced in local gyms, while other migrants have fled to the surrounding woods. The blaze left close to 1,500 people homeless. I have no home for schlafen, for alles. And we are glücklich. House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi joined the Anne Frank Center today in urging the White House to fire Sean Spicer, accusing him of being a Holocaust denier, after he said this in his press briefing. Had a, you know, someone as despicable as Hitler, who didn't even sink to the, to the, to using chemical weapons. I think when you come to sarin gas, uh, there was no, he was not using the gas on his own people the same way that a shot is doing. I mean, there was clearly, I, I, I understand it, but thank you. I, I, thank you, I appreciate that. There was not in the, in the he brought him into the, to, um, to the Holocaust Center, I understand that. Spicer later apologized. This morning, Iraqi federal police carried out punishing raids on three ISIS positions in western Mosul, killing five militants and seizing a stash of weapons. Islamic State forces are losing large numbers of men along with their grip on a city they once completely controlled. But they're making a ferocious last stand. According to the top U.S. commander in Iraq, the battle for western Mosul is the most brutal urban combat since World War II. The fighting is now centered on the Great Mosque of Al-Nuri, in Mosul's old city. It's a symbolic site for ISIS, where its leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi made his only known public appearance, announcing the creation of an Islamic caliphate in July 2014. In western Mosul right now, it's hard to recognize the neighborhoods. But this is Bab al-Tob. It's been at the center of heavy fighting in recent weeks. As the front line inches forward, all that's left behind is an eerie devastation. The buildings here are obliterated. There are no people to be seen, except the Federal Police 3rd Division, who are waging a deadly sniper war with what's left of ISIS. Major Hisham Amir says they've lost three men to ISIS snipers in the past week. Once they take the mosque, does that mean victory for the Iraqi forces? <laughs> But the buildings in front of the mosque are being defended so fiercely, it's brought the advance in this direction grinding to a halt. Iraqi forces are now going slowly, house by house, surrounding Al-Nuri Mosque and cornering ISIS in the old city. Karaj Asim is a sharpshooter brought in to try to break the deadlock. <laughs> Uh, 
اقدر اسيطر عليه He sets up his position 900 yards from the mosque. The mosque is just over there, literally. So it's just on the other side of this building where the ISIS positions are. And they've got snipers in a lot of these places. You can see one of the bullets that's actually almost pierced the side of this building. On the floors below, the division snipers take aim. They say ISIS keep themselves well hidden. But you can see the black flag flying in the streets below. So there's a lot of outgoing now. They can see some ISIS activity. They get information on the radio that there's fighters just across the street over there. This team has been firing at ISIS for so long today that they've run out of ammunition. They say some of the heaviest incoming fire happens at night. The soldiers have been living on the front lines for nearly six months now. They've been involved since the operation to recapture Mosul began. But with the mosque still out of reach, there's a lot more fighting to come. And ISIS seems prepared to keep going until the last bullet is fired. Presidents choose other politicians for cabinet posts, they try to make sure they're from safe districts so that the president's party can fill the vacancies. President Trump's picks are turning out to be a little less safe than advertised, which is why a special election in Kansas today is shaping up to be a big test. CIA Director Mike Pompeo was a Republican congressman from Kansas. Health and Human Services Secretary Tom Price was a Republican congressman from Georgia. And both had really red districts, the kind of places you can generally count on to vote for anything that breathes and calls itself a Republican. A Vice News team went to Wichita this weekend to check in on the race to replace Pompeo. The Republican favorite to win the election, Kansas State Treasurer Ron Estes, didn't want to talk to us. His campaign, for the most part, ignored emails and phone calls. And at a tulip festival on Sunday, Essis was not interested in chatting. Thank you. He gave us the brush off. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This isn't all that weird. For Estes, silence is a good strategy. Kansas's fourth district is reliably Republican. Really reliably Republican. President Trump won by 27 points last November, and Pompeo won with 61% of the vote. But voter moves have changed a lot since November. So Republican leadership has been mobilizing to make sure Estes wins. It's great to be back in Kansas. Ted Cruz campaigned in Wichita so Monday. Friends, you know. It's just plain wrong. James the National Republican Party launched a negative campaign ad. It gets worse. James Thompson supports abortion even if the parents don't like the gender of their baby. Hello, this is President Donald Trump. And President Trump recorded a robocall. But I need Republicans like Ron Estes to help me get the job done. Democrats have proven to be so angry at President Trump's Electoral College win that Democrat James Thompson, who should be an extreme underdog, is raising way more money than anyone expected from national progressives eager to make Republicans look bad. And he's spending it by tying his opponent to a Republican Kansans don't like. Here in Kansas, there's still a lot of people that um, are fond of Trump. So I think that we have um, a re referendum on President Trump somewhat, but a lot of what we're seeing also is a referendum on how much everybody here dislikes our governor, Sam Brownback. Only one governor in the country is more disliked than Kansas Governor Sam Brownback, according to a new survey out this morning. Absolutely every single vote counts right now, so... Thompson's still losing. Every vote. But the less he loses by in Kansas, the more it'll feed a narrative of Democratic momentum. And the more national attention and money will go to the next special election in Georgia. The Democratic hopeful down there is John Ossoff. 
For progressives across the country, slightly frayed Republican nerves are enough. Democrats nationally are hoping to use these elections to signal to Republicans that backing Trump could be a big problem down the road in their own elections. I mean, I think at this point we've already been successful. We've done what they thought was impossible, which was turn this deep red state um, into a competitive race. The alt-right movement once worshipped Donald Trump, but some of his most strident supporters are rethinking the bromance after what they see as a betrayal. Trump's missile strike on Syria. Ellie Reeve has more. The alt-right is mad at Donald Trump. They're sharing videos of rants against warmongering baby boomers, posting nihilistic declarations like, you can't vote your way out of the decline of civilization. Sometimes with irony, sometimes not. There's a misconception that members of the alt-right are like regular conservatives with more racism. That's not entirely true. Some want universal health care, and they're anti-war. They take Trump's America First slogan, originally coined by people who opposed the US entering World War II, to mean no more military interventions. Lauren Southern, a Canadian alt-right YouTuber who legally changed her gender as a statement against gender identity laws, once loved Trump. After the strike, she's saying this. Mr. President, what the fuck? Even Richard Spencer, known for this. Hail Trump, hail our people, hail victory. Is now saying this. No one voted for this. No one voted for Donald Trump in order for him to engage in these kinds of senseless, insane military interventions. Trump is kind of dead to me. Millennial Woes is a Scottish alt-right YouTuber. We sent him a list of questions about Syria, and he responded with a video. Do you feel Donald Trump betrayed his voters? And the answer is yes, because the airstrike represents a return to utopian, short-sighted, and materialistic foreign interventionism. So will they abandon Trump forever? Well, with this strike, it seems such a betrayal that he has a lot of making up to do, for sure. But really, the main question is, is this the prelude to war? British scientists say they've identified the specific mechanism that makes certain bacteria resistant to a key antibiotic. It's part of a larger battle against drug-resistant bacteria, one of the world's most stubborn health problems. Once bacteria gets in the blood, it generally can lead to what's called a septic shock syndrome. Kidney failure, liver failure, you can get central nervous system issues, but generally you have a difficult time maintaining the blood pressure of the patient. Dr. Anthony Fauci runs infectious disease research at the National Institutes of Health. One of their major priorities is finding ways to stop drug-resistant bacteria, which kill about 50,000 people a year in America and Europe alone. In February, the World Health Organization put out a list of the 12 most dangerous of these so-called superbugs. At the top, a rod-shaped bacterium called Acinetobacter baumani that preys on hospital patients. Now, Acinetobacter is generally a microbe that's in soil and water. The threat of Acinetobacters became very much on our radar screen in the war wounds of our troops that were fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan. If you look at the rate of antimicrobial resistance with Acinetobacter, it's high. 50% of them are resistant to carbapenem, which is a very important antibiotic that you generally treat these infections with when they're not resistant. Depending upon when you get it, you get what's called bacteremia. You have a central line in or a catheter. That's the original seed of the bacteria and then it seeds the blood. You get a bloodstream infection, you can wind up getting septicemia and multiple organ system failure. Fauci says that the key to stopping superbugs like these isn't necessarily chasing them with new drugs, but targeting existing drugs against them and trying to stop transmission in hospitals. And he thinks the PR campaign might be working. Keep 
people like a challenge. So when you come out and you have WHO and the CDC saying, hey, multiple drug-resistant bacteria is a real problem, that's a challenge that excites people and say, well, you know, if I'm going to work on something, I want to work on something that's important where what I do will have an impact. Today, Javier Zamora, a strawberry farmer in California's Central Valley, is handing over control for a plot of land to his former field worker in hopes that he'll stick around. Jose Flores, an undocumented immigrant, has been working California farms for 17 years. Esta variedad es por Pucheroqui. Tenemos brandy, wine red. A massive labor shortage this season has forced farmers to compete fiercely for skilled hands like him offering benefits like health insurance, childcare, paid time off, or, in Jose and his wife's case, a piece of the land. The number of field workers in California has shrunk nearly 40% since 2002. The result, economists and other experts say, of tightened immigration policies and an improved Mexican economy. For some workers, it's changing the dynamic. How does it feel to have your own farm now? Está uno con la ilusión de tener su propio negocio, pues tratar de irse superando poco a poco para no tener que pues depender de otra persona, pues que, que lo esté uno mandando. A veces lo tratan uno mal en, en los trabajos y Javier operates a small 30-acre farm with tight financial margins and he distributes to organic grocery stores himself. This year, he has to raise wages by 20% in order to hold on to his other workers. It's an increase that I can handle, but you know, it's gonna impact the bottom line. But you worry they'll be poached. I do. There's a lot of work to do and not enough people that are willing to do what we do. Some farmers are just producing less labor-intensive crops, like tomatoes and alfalfa, that can be harvested by machines instead of by hand. Because of the labor shortage, U.S. farms produced 9.5% fewer fruits and vegetables last year, resulting in about $3.1 billion of lost revenue. The labor shortage in California for agricultural workers is extreme. And we work with a lot of small farms that can't find labor. 100 miles north in Oakland, Anthony Chang runs Kitchen Table Advisors, a nonprofit business advisory for small farms. We have one farmer that we support in Watsonville that last year she had to leave thousands of dollars worth of strawberries in the field because there wasn't enough labor to actually harvest and enable her to sell that crop. Farming is hard. It's a hard business, but this is probably at the top of the list of what keeps farmers up at night. This has been a growing problem for 15 years, but this summer will be the biggest wage jump some farmers have ever seen. ¿Cómo está la familia? Workers we spoke with said people are leaving California because there are more opportunities in Mexico now. It has a better social safety net, and coming to the U.S. is harder than before. There is a fear of really being out in the community, putting yourself at risk um, for deportation. Even though he's making more money than ever, Jose is not comfortable spending it. Are you scared? Pues sí, sí da miedo a veces eh, salir porque pues... What are you going to do if the shortage gets worse? Now we'll have to scale back. So that means less production. Maybe even the quality won't be that good because we will not be able to keep up. And if that were to happen, I think instead of the 3 $4 per pound of strawberries, you'll probably be paying about $12, $15. Oh, this is Man, there's some good music out right now. One, two, three, four. He's always dope to see the person live. Because they just be on the stage like, ah. this song is about finding yourself. I would let my baby listen to this. I don't have kids. But I, if I had babies, I would play this for my babies. 
it's real good vibes. You know what I'm saying? Maybe they make them probably like want to grow up to be an astronaut or something. Yeah, this is tight as a motherfucker. It sound like um, seven people are just sitting around in a room and everybody's making a noise with the beat. Like somebody's like slapping a Hey, this is my favorite down. song so far. This is going go hard. Why do you like Who you sang know? this? This is Animal Collective. Shout out to Animal Collective. Going bonkers right now. Go bonkers. <laughs> Was it soft rock? Is it soft rock or hard rock? I don't know. I like that though. I like what he's saying. He said, What? Show me what you made of, huh? Come alive. That jack go hard. Hey, beef beat, street sweet, spring clean. Let me how that run into the next thing. It probably has a deep message behind it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's political. Yeah. I'm trying to like get crunk and shit. Can you get crunk to this? <laughs> I I can't, but I can't speak for nobody else. You know I what I'm could break dance to this. Ah! That's Vice News tonight for Tuesday, April 11th.